Welcome to the Emerging Civil War podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and I'm pleased today to have with me a fellow Buffalo Bills fan, although to the Civil War world, he's known as, as one of the, uh, the young up-and-coming geniuses, but I know him as a fellow Buffalo Bills fan. Jonathan Noyalis, the director of the McCormick Civil War Institute at Shenandoah University. Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, once upon a time, I probably should not have politely outed you as a Bills fan because that would bring scorn and, and uh, heap derision upon you. But we're doing okay this season, right? We are. This is, you know, we're 4-0 and and things are looking up in Buffalo. So that's good. <laughs> but I've got to say, things have been looking up um, at, at Shenandoah. Um, since you've taken over directorship of the Institute, just some fantastic things going on there the past couple of years. And uh, pleased to have you with us today to talk about one of those projects. Um, joining us also are two of his students, Jay Richardson and Nikki Rowland. Um, and they have been collaborating on a project, taking a look at some of the veterans in the Shenandoah Valley and uh, kind of what their lives were like. And Jonathan, you want to tell us a little bit about the project? Yeah, sure. So let me, let me begin by just kind of talking about why we decided to do this. So every summer um, since I came to Shenandoah in 2017, uh, we've received funding from uh, two really great, wonderful people uh, from Leesburg, Virginia, Dr. David Melanie, uh, Dr. David Miles and Mrs. Melanie Miles. And they've offered financial support for me to hire two students to work on some really, you know, new cutting edge research throughout the course of the summer. And so the first, you know, several years we, we worked on projects related to Cool Spring so some of your listeners might know that we, the university owns 195 acres of the Cool Spring Battlefield in Clark County, um, which was kind of the, the tail end of Early's Washington campaign. But this year, because of COVID um, and the fact that we couldn't really get to archives and all that kind of stuff and how to really make good use of, of online resources, that coupled with the fact that we had a donation um, in early 2020 of a, of a tintype photograph of Private Harrison White, who served in the Second New York Heavy Artillery, he served for the duration of the war. Um, he moved to Shenandoah County after the conflict, and this got me to thinking about, you know, how, what was the number of Union veterans living in the Shenandoah Valley? How many veterans, you know, after the conflict moved to the region? And so I, I did some cursory digging and realized there were quite a number of Union veterans who, who lived in the Shenandoah Valley at the time of the 1890 census. And I thought with COVID, this is really the, the perfect time for us to begin transcribing and begin researching the backgrounds of some of these veterans who were here um, at that particular time. And one of the things that we certainly revealed um, is that not all of the veterans were recorded in that census. So Harrison White, the guy who was sort of the the impetus for the whole project, he died in 1913. He's buried um, in Shenandoah County, Virginia. He moved here in 1870. He wasn't included in that census. And I think, Chris, you probably know um, as well as, as I do that one of the, the frustrating things about that census is how incomplete it was, um, how there really was a lack of attention to, deta to detail among those census takers. But I'm hopeful that you know the 576 veterans who we've identified, as we research their backgrounds, um, it is going to shed light not only in the post-war period, and you know how these individuals might have interacted with Confederate veterans, say for instance as members of Grand Army of the Republic posts in Martinsburg, or in Winchester, or Harper's Ferry, but it's also revealing to us a little bit about uh, some of these veterans who were born and bred in the Shenandoah Valley. So it's gonna shed some light on unionist sentiment um, in the Valley as well. And I had two great, wonderful um, up and coming historians in Jay Richardson and Nikki Rowland uh, culling through these, these census records this summer and researching uh, some of these individuals. And it's been a pleasure to work with them on this project. So, Jay, let me bring you in here for a quick second. Um, when, when Professor Nayalis brought this project to you and you had the chance to spend your summer going through census records, what did you think? Um, it, was a, it was a great challenge. I mean, I, I, hit it, I hit the ground running with it and said, okay, you know, let's try and develop this new skill, which is deciphering 
the the handwriting of people, you know, bureaucrats from 130 years ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really interesting um, to find what we call you know, rabbit holes or or just um, things that that just lead you down different trails and 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 get you to find stuff that you didn't think you would uncover. And, and Nikki, I'll bring you in as well. And, and the whole idea of, of data-driven research, something we can easily do on a computer with modern statistics, but having to sort through by hand and, and a very time-intensive process, I imagine. Yeah, so of course I didn't do the statistics first. I mean, I did that when I was over with. Um, but I noticed that as I was going, um, a lot of them came from other countries, which was surprising. So my biggest problem was I had a lot of German folks so trying to first of all figure out um like the census takers notes on that and then try to figure out which german name corresponded to that was really tough but in terms of statistics yeah they came from everywhere and nowhere um a lot of those towns don't exist anymore either in those states which i found really interesting so trying to find any sort of history about those people was tough and, and I suppose I, I, my use of the term statistics in an inexact way, um, you know, I'm just thinking about the just the massive amount of record keeping that you have to go through. And then, of course, you can crunch some numbers out of all that. But that's just a, a lot of data to manage. Um, have, have either of you had to manage that much data before? I've certainly never had to look at that many uh, raw primary documents before. And actually, and actually go through them meticulously. Like, okay, what am I looking at here? What is this? Okay, is this my my person? How does this pertain to my person? Because sometimes you'd come across on ancestry, you come across death certificates for their children, which which were good because they would have their fathers birthplace on there. So one, I remember one um, death certificate I found, I think it was for, for this one gentleman's sister. Um, it said on it that their, their father was born on a, on a ship coming from Ireland. So I thought that was interesting. So yeah, like Nikki said, a, a fair number of them were, a lot of mine were from Ireland. Um, but I can, I can certainly understand a lot of Germans probably down there in Rockingham County. <laughs> so as the two of you were trying to get your arms around this you know, massive amount of information and all these people that you had to track down and all these rabbit holes, um, how did you guys first decide to approach this project? And then Jonathan, and then I'll circle back and ask you like as a professor, how would you have um, hoped they would have done it? And then we'll see how those answers compare. But, but uh, Jay and Nikki, he gives you this information, go to it. How do you attack that? So what was really good was um, in the beginning of the semester um, from when we started, he actually put all of his students with the task of researching one soldier. So we were at least comfortable with some of the sources that we know we should use. Mm -hmm. um, but of course that was for one person. So when you get a whole bunch of them thrown to you, you need to kind of do some digging. Um, one thing that I knew I had to do was go through regimental histories, but I didn't realize how many <laughs> regiments that I had to go through. So thankfully that there was a lot of different um, quote historians that are going out and writing and typing all of those. So really grateful for those people out there. Jay, how about you? Um, I guess um, the process, and like Nick said, we, we got a, a nice trial run on on doing this, um, but I, I just sort of um, approached it from <clears throat> the research perspective, which is just to gather as much as possible. Fortunately, I mean, the, the sources like Ancestry make it so easy to compile all this different stuff, keep it in one place, and then you can um, actually start to piece this stuff together. And so that was, that was where I, where I had to get very systematic with taking these little bits of information 
these primary sources and using them to actually piece together the story of someone's life. And that was very, very different. Something I'd never done before, certainly. So Jonathan, I think it was, I think it was really tough in the beginning. Oh, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I think it was really tough in the beginning because I knew that there were a few sources I had to think about, like here are the, the top three to go through, but you had to learn over these two months of like, like you said, the systematic way of learning it. So by the end, I don't want to say I'm an expert, but like, I definitely know how to approach it now. Hey, Jonathan, I suspect like yeah. one part of you is thinking like, here, I'm going to give them all this. Let's see what they do. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, you, you realize you have to guide them in some respects, but not lead them by the hand. How do you approach that? Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, this is a big project to manage. Um, so, you know, in the months leading up to this, I, I went through and just did a basic count, you know, kind of a, a rough, how many veterans were there? And there's 576 Union veterans who are enumerated in the 10 counties in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and I knew we had two months to do this. So, you know, I knew going in, there was no way that we were going to complete this. This is the beginning of a multi-year project. Um, so really what I did was I, I broke it up and gave Nikki and Jay certain counties to look at. And, and step one was, you know, transcribing those records as best as, as we could. And, you know, the, the handwriting, of course, you know, Chris, you, you look at primary documents all the time. And there's a reason historians wear glasses, um, <laughs> because we go blind in the process trying to decipher the, the handwriting. But I basically set a goal. Um, I was not thinking that, that Nikki and Jay would be able to research and transcribe and write about you know, 150 of these guys in two months. So we set the initial goal of, you know, 20 individuals the first month, 20 individuals the second month. And so by that point, we, by the end of the summer, we would have at least a sampling, you know, about 20% of those biographies completed where we could kind of begin to, to draw some initial conclusions or, or, or some initial hypotheses we could form basically about, what the demographics looked like. And one of the really, you know, neat things for me to see, um, I mean, the biggest population of Union veterans, not surprisingly, is, is where I live in Berkeley County, West Virginia. Um, 204 of the 576 veterans in 1890 were living in Berkeley County. And there was very, very strong Union sentiment here, you know, throughout the course of the war. A lot of those guys who are living here in 1890, they're from you know, Berkeley County, West Virginia. But what was really interesting for me to go through uh, is, is to read the biographies that Jay and Nikki were, were sending me. And, you know, I wasn't asking them really to kind of crunch any of the preliminary numbers, but as they were coming in, I started looking at, at the pieces and it was quite interesting to me to see that, you know, like 27% roughly of the Union veterans we identified were from the Valley. They were born here. Um, and I remember, you know, releasing this on social media after we had our initial um, findings at the end of July. And some people were, were shocked by that because I think the, the perspective is, and Jay knows this, uh, Jay works at the Third Winchester Visitor Center, which is owned by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. And some people were really shocked by this and almost kind of resistant to it that this wasn't reality because, you know, I think the broader public has this perception that everybody who lives in the, in the Valley who is white, um, African Americans, of course, aren't going to support the Confederacy, but everyone who's white was gung ho for the Confederacy. And, you know, I know from years and years and years of research in the Valley, that's certainly not the case, but, you know, now we're able to start to put some, some names, and some hard data to this to really paint a picture of, of what the unionist sentiment really is looking like um, in the Valley. And I think there's one, uh, I believe it was uh, one of Nikki's soldiers ended up more than likely being drafted in the Confederate army. He deserted and then ended up enlisting in a union regiment. So, I mean, if that doesn't show commitment to the union war effort, ultimately I don't know what was. So it's really gonna be interesting to see how this kind of evolves um, over the next couple of years and we get that much fuller picture. And also what, what this has uncovered, and I'll let Jay and, and Nikki kind of talk more about some specific examples, 
But I mean, this is revealing, you know, United States colored troops who are born and bred in the Valley, went out to fight, survived the war and came back. And also individuals who worked as scouts. So they weren't, you know, traditional combatants, you know, enlisting in an infantry regiment, but nonetheless provided some really important um, support and information intelligence uh, to Union generals operating in the Shenandoah Valley throughout the course of the war. Now, did you find, uh, you know, the further up the valley you went, those demographics changed as you got farther away from the border? Yeah, so, you know, as we kind of crunch the numbers, you can, you can see um, northern part of the Shenandoah Valley, that's where the bulk of these Union veterans are. So, you know, 36% are living in Berkeley County, 18% um, in Jefferson County, 14 and a half in Frederick, and it just goes down. By the time you get to, um, you know, Rockbridge County, there's 34 Union veterans living there at the end of the war. And all the initial indicators are that the majority of them are guys who are not from the Valley. They're moving here to, to take part in various business ventures and the like. So, uh, Nikki, I'll swing back to you as you're looking through this information and this data. Um, who jumped out at you? What surprised you? So, um, my favorite guy um, that I actually liked learning about was actually someone who was in the Navy. Um, Cause I was obviously looking for like cavalrymen or infantrymen, but when I saw um, someone from the Navy that really stuck out to me. And I think what was really interesting in terms of doing research is I found nothing on him. <laughs> um, I actually looked at his wife because since he was, um, he was on the USS Colorado. So he was um, actually in Asia doing um, like commerce business. Um, his wife was taking care of the house. Um, there was a group, I don't know who, a union and cavalry and infantry uh, group that came in and stormed his 16 mile plantation and raided all the food, killed and took all of the animals, um, raided their house, stole like all of their valuables. Um, and of course, his wife had to, like, she ran for help, right? She ran all the way to Winchester. She actually met up with um, Milroy and said, can you help me? Like, your men are doing horrible things to me and my family. And presumably, because he actually gave an alibi during the case trial and said, yes, his wife came up to me. I kind of helped her out. I told these men, stop what you're doing. And they left the next morning from that house. So that was really interesting to see. That was purely by accident too. So I yeah, guess my favorite. one of those rabbit holes that Jay mentioned, you're, you're looking for one thing and suddenly you kind of fall down someplace you're not expecting. It unraveled because I had all of the case alibis. So of course it was like the paymaster general of the US Navy alibi, Milroy's alibi. Then there was actually slave alibis too. Like there was, I guess, a head slave who was outside he gave details about how many ears of corn that was taken oh. it was so descriptive yeah it really literally was a rabbit hole oh. jay how about you what surprised you as you were looking through well um i guess touching on something that jonathan said um i guess when i was about close to halfway through this i noticed that there was a pattern here um the pattern was um and Yes, the demographics were different. Um, one thing I noticed about Rockbridge County was that there were several officers there. Um, one who was uh, the one that I find was the most, um, ha had the richest story here, um, was a cavalry officer, cavalry captain from Vermont, um, who was in the 1st Vermont Cavalry, and he was uh, wounded at Gettysburg. Um, he eventually moved to Natural Bridge, and he owned Natural Bridge, um, operated three hotels there. Um, he was also involved with the Richmond and Allegheny Railroad, Allegheny Railroad. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was interesting to find out that people were coming to different parts for different reasons. A lot of people that came to Rockbridge County were doing so for industry, um, a lot of people that came through Winchester or, or were living in Winchester at the time um, came through, what brought them to Winchester was marriage, a lot of them. One, one I found was, one of the first ones I did 
um, was a guy who was a was appointed to be a lieutenant in the 38th U.S. Colored Troops. Um, and then eventually he became a quartermaster. He was in um, Texas. He was stationed in Winchester as a quartermaster, married someone from Winchester. And then eventually he ended up in Vancouver. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Had a child there. And then he got sick, came back to Winchester, where he died shortly thereafter. And he's buried at Mount Hebron Cemetery in Winchester. So <laughs> that was uh, that was one that went all over the place. So I, I can't blame him. Marriage is what brought me to Virginia as well. I'm a carpetbag and Yankee from the north. Um, uh, more seriously, though, you, you mentioned that that lots of different reasons brought them here, and I'll ask any of the three of you to to address this. But um, what primarily brought them? Were they part of that? Uh, you know, wave of, of uh, exploitation that we, you know, maybe hear about in stereotypes? Are they really out looking for new life? You know, why are they coming? Yeah, I think in a, in a, in a broad sense, so if you look at Berkeley County, um, you know, there's one individual from the 87 Pennsylvania, he was an officer. Um, he moved here after the war specifically to work for the Baltimore Ohio Railroad. Um, so, you know, you do have I think individuals within Berkeley, Jefferson, and Frederick, the preliminary data is suggesting, you know, they're, they're coming here, they're in some way connected to the railroad. Um, that's what's drawing them here. I think if you get further south in the valley, up the valley, um, you know, you have individuals like Jay is referring, and I think Jay, you're talking about Henry Chester Parson, right? Yes. First Vermont Cav. Um, you know, he, he's coming here for business ventures, but also, you know, it's, it's interesting if you look at, at when these individuals are coming. So it's, it's not right after the war. Uh, I think for some of them, it's, it's late 1870s, early 1880s. And, you know, Chris, you know, this is kind of that moment in time where you start to see moving towards, you know, the era of reconciliation, essentially. And, and one of the things that sort of I think at least in the Valley kind of fuels this and there are other historians, you know, who have made this argument, but that kind of fuels that, you know, the white reconciliation at least, um, are the interactions that these, that local people have with union veterans in, in business type settings. You know, there's a lot of resorts and springs and hotels that really dot the landscape after the war. And I think to a certain extent that kind of, you know, eases some of the, the animosity that exists. And then by the, the mid 1880s opens up the doors for, you know, Sheridan's veterans to return to the Valley and start, you know, dedicating monuments and those types of things. So I don't, I don't think it's the, you know, the, the stereotypical greedy carpetbagger um, that, that Confederate veterans detested, you know, coming into the South to profit and to exploit. I think it's more, you know, late 1870s, early part of the 1880s is when they're, they're coming here. I can see if you're coming down and you're setting up a small business, you become an integral part of the community that way. You know? Yeah. I noticed that um, some of the men that came from the North were skilled laborers. Um, whereas a lot of the people that were from the Valley were farmers. And then they just went right back to their farms at the end of the war. Nikki, anything you notice about any of, uh, any of these trends? Um, I surely don't know the reason why, but when all of the regiments ended and mustered out, they were around where we were studying, like in Virginia, right? So they stopped here. They went back home to whatever state, maybe Massachusetts or New York. I guess they finished up, uh, tied some loose ends and then actually came back. So whether it was the landscape or they fell in love with the area, the people, I don't know. But it was interesting that they kind of looped back around. But it, it, no one else was right. Like, it did take 10 or 20 years for them to come back. But then, yeah, I, I think just to, to add to Nikki's point, you know, there are, I think, a lot of examples from, you know, letters from soldiers in the Valley who, who constantly throughout the war, you know, remark about its beauty and those types of things. And I think, honestly, there are some who, who, come, be, who come back because of that. Um, I mean, certainly when I came to the Valley in the, in the 90s to attend Shenandoah, I thought, wow, this is a beautiful place. And I ended up staying here. So, 
And it is kind of interesting that you're able to trace the fact that they came through that area and whatever it was that connected to them brought them back. But uh, those are those to me are the sort of uh, wonderful uh, breadcrumbs that you find along the way that really uh, add a lot of illumination to a story like this. So how one of the things that I find fascinating about this project is that um, it really sheds a whole different life on post-war Shenandoah. And of course, the valley is so storied and famous for its role in the war. But here we've got a way to look at it after the war in such a unique way that really deepens our understanding about it. It seems like you've got lots of, of uh, ground, fertile ground to still explore with this. Yeah, and I, I said, you know, this is a, a multi-year project. Um, and, you know, what we, what we end up doing with this, uh, who knows? So, you know, there's a couple of, of ideas that I have about, you know, creating some kind of an online presence through our website. You know, we publish an annual journal. Um, if we find enough of good stuff, this might be a, another book publication for, for the Institute to publish. So yeah, there's a lot of really fertile ground here. And it's kind of interesting to me that it's no one, no one has ever really thought to, to do this before. Um, because I mean, the 1890 veteran census, it's, I mean, now in the age of, you know, the internet and ancestry, it's so easy to access. And it's, it's really interesting to me that, that no one has, has even thought about exploring this and all the, the kinds of things that this can open up. So Jay, Nikki, um, you know, you've got all, all of this on your mind. What are you gonna be able to do with this project as you take your own careers forward? How is this project gonna help you as you uh, continue your forward trajectories? Well, um, it's certainly been, it's certainly been a, an experience, certainly been something, um, it's been new ground for me. And what I think was the most rewarding part about it was um, not just finding out about uh, these men, finding about their lives, but also it was so amazing that in just, I think I had 37 bios in total, it, just in that tiny little sample, there was this pattern there and there were this, and there was this basically the same kind of um, percentage split that, that Jonathan has, has found in total. I mean, you know, about 50% from the North, about 30% from, um, about 28 percent from the valley and about 25 or so percent from um, Ireland and other countries so I think it's I think it'll be I think there's definitely something to be written about it um, not just about the men themselves but in the context of of a bit a broader theme here Nikki how about you how's this project going to help you as you continue forward yeah, uh, ditto to everything that Jay said. Um, but I think what fascinates me a lot about history is um, the unspoken word of the common folk. Because you hear and you read all these like biographies about these famous generals, but you never hear about the common person. And they have the same fascinating stories too. And once you start linking them all together, it really tells the history of whatever county that you're talking about. And to put um, the history of just that county in the small, uh, in the large, you know, spectrum of the Civil War. Um, it plays a part in telling the story. So uh, one question I haven't asked, it's kind of an obvious one. Was there a, you know, a specific set of areas where these uh, Union veterans came from? I mean, like, were they all from New England or Massachusetts? Did you get folks from the West that came here? Yeah, it's, it's really all over. I mean, there's a, I think there's a, a fair amount who are coming from Ohio. Pennsylvania, New York, but there are individuals from Indiana uh, who come, not really a lot of New Englanders, there's some, but it's really, it seems that the majority are from Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio that are coming here okay. uh, after the war. So more on a personal level, um, Jay, Nikki, um, what's up next for you as historians, since I'm all about work of young voices, emerging voices in this field? Well, um, I'm um, now the full-time 
um, bark ranger for the, the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. Um, I'm actually district wide. So um, we're going to be putting together lots of, hopefully I'll be putting together lots of events um, and tours of our less traveled little bits of, of property that we own all over the Shenandoah Valley. Um, we were just at Tom's Brook uh, earlier today, getting a bunch of footage. Oh, wonderful. Lots of stuff going on out there in the valley and, and the work. That Great to just actually explore. I've never actually um, been out exploring much south of Winchester, so it's going to be great. Happy battlefielding to you. Yep. <laughs> Nikki, how about you? Um, so I took a semester off before going to graduate school because I really wanted to explore some of the public history um, avenues. Um, kind of found out what I really love and hopefully I'm going to apply to graduate school soon. Um, I'm looking at Virginia schools. Um, DC is like my dream goal. You know, go big or go home, right? Right, right, right. So you say you found what you really love. So what's the answer to that question? Yeah, um, smaller public history museums. Um, that's where out is uh, like I said earlier, like the unspoken word of these smaller places that play in the big history of the entire country. Um, I think these smaller places really need to um, get a lot more um, of their voice spoken out. Yeah, I keep repeating myself, but that, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I love the battlefield, um, but I uh, worked at the uh, courthouse museum in here in Winchester for um, a year and I mean, that's my home away from home because there's so much graffiti in there and only about, uh, I think, let, yeah, only about a third of it has actually been interpreted. So, Jonathan, it seems to me like a perfect opportunity since we're talking about small public history opportunities, Cool Springs. You guys are doing some really neat things out of the Cool Springs battlefield. Can't pass up the opportunity to let you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, Cool Spring has, um, so little little background for the listeners who, who don't really know too much about this, but in 2013, the Civil War Trust, so now the American Battlefield um, Trust, purchased 195 acres of the Cool Spring Battlefield on the east side of the Shenandoah River, and it was given to Shenandoah University with the idea that the university use it as an outdoor classroom. And at the time, um, I was teaching at Lord Fairfax Community College in Middletown. So the acquisition of that battlefield and it is really what brought me to Shenandoah. Um, so, you know, since I came, we've really used this as an opportunity to teach our students um, in Civil War era studies how to do history. So there's, there's the classroom history where we, you know, we talk about strategy and battles and civilians and decisions and all those types of things. But there's nothing like, you know, real boots on the ground, hands on experience. So, you know, over the past several years, we've developed, you know, kind of traditional interpretive um, media out there. So we have a printed brochure, we have, you know, wayside signs uh, from the Virginia Civil War Trails, you know, exhibition, but we're really doing a lot out there with virtual reality and augmented reality. So we have, we're, we're hopefully, I mean, COVID has slowed things down in the production process, but hopefully by the end of this year, we will have two different kinds of augmented experiences, experiences for people out there. So individuals will be able to download an app for free through the McCormick Civil War Institute, where they will be able to walk around the battlefield. And when they get to a certain spot, it's GPS enabled, there will be a, a, it'll be my voice that comes on. And it will be talking about a particular soldier who was in that particular area talking about a particular moment of the battle. And then we have the, the primary account of that soldier, you know, what he was thinking at that particular moment. And then we also have this virtual reality experience. So a 360 video experience where individuals were brought into a moment, again, all based on primary accounts of these Union and Confederate soldiers. And each virtual reality experience is like two, two and a half minutes, but it brings you into this moment. We filmed them last, well, we filmed them in the summer of 2019. So it takes a lot of time to, to do all the tech and, and to get everything pulled together. So 
we're really using this as an opportunity to to tell those individual stories. And you know, as Nikki has pointed out, just with the Census Project, um, I'm really about the individual stories. So you know, my my graduate mentor, God rest his soul, Bud Robertson from Virginia Tech. Um, the first thing he conveyed in in the Civil War graduate seminar at Tech, uh, now many years ago, was that the Civil War and all history at its core is about people. It's about individual stories, and you know that has always stuck with me. And that's what we do out there is we you know try to tell as many of those individual stories as possible. I think to help people understand the magnitude of the war. You know, oftentimes individuals look at the Civil War and and they look at a battle like Cool Spring. And they'll say, oh, it's, it's, it's not as big as Gettysburg or Antietam or Shiloh or Chickamauga. And, you know, statistically, it's not. But one of the things I sort of inculcate into my students is that, you know, for individuals who are wounded at a battle or for a family member who has a loved one killed at a battle, that is the biggest battle of the war for them because that forever alters um, their lives. And, you know, we have so many powerful stories, like every Civil War site but so many powerful stories of individuals that really, you know, teach us a lot of really important lessons, the biggest of which, and, and I know Nikki and Jay have heard this sermon many times, but, you know, people ask, you know, wh why go to a Civil War battlefield? What's the point of it all? Isn't, isn't every battlefield the same? Um, do we need battlefields? I mean, Gary Gallagher, I think you had him on your podcast recently, I'm um, talking about his, his new book, The Enduring Civil War, and I've had the, the fortune to review that. Um, and, you know, Gary in there talks about some Civil War historians who don't think that there's any value in preserving battlefields. That just blows my mind. Uh, because, you know, battlefields aren't just about troop movements. They, they allow us an opportunity to talk about larger questions in the conflict. And, you know, battles make, you know, they, they make widows and they make orphans and they make individuals who have been impacted, you know, psychologically and physically by all of this. Um, and I can't think of a better place to talk about the war's complexities than a Civil War site. And that's what we really try to do um, at Cool Spring in a lot of, I think, sort of innovative, innovative ways using technology. Jay, Nikki, since he said that you've heard this sermon before, can I get an amen out of the two of you for what he just said? Amen. <laughs> That was a fantastic sermon. I'd listen to that over and over. Um, so if someone is interested in following your veterans project as it continues to unfold over the course of the next few years uh, and wants to follow along with some of the other neat things that you guys are doing at the McCormick Institute, how can they do that, Jonathan? Yeah, so there's, there's different ways. Um, the Institute, uh, we have a website, su.edu backslash mcwi. Uh, we do have a, a Facebook presence, and also uh, we've been using Twitter more, so at McCormick CWI uh, is the handle to follow on Twitter. Um, if anyone wants to be added to our, our quarterly newsletter emailing list, they can email me at jnoyalas01 at su.edu, and I'm happy to put people on that list. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways that people can can stay up to date with what we're doing and, and what's on the horizon. And I will say that the uh, McCormick Institute is a dynamic institute, just lots of uh, really great stuff going on there. So before I wrap up, Jay, Nikki, I wanna just give you one final opportunity each. Uh, any final thoughts for our listeners and viewers today? Putting you on the spot, I know. <laughs> yeah, just keep, keep studying history. I mean, like, I think history is just a passion of many, whether um, what it, whatever different aspect you do, I mean, whatever contributions you have, even just researching at home, um, even just doing ancestry just for fun really helps every past, future, present, whatever historian in the making. And you, everything you do is contributing and helping us. Yeah, and, and it's the Civil War still speaks to us today. Um, and it's, um, it's really interesting to see that from like what Nikki said from not from the top down but from the average person from the bottom up I think that's that's really a good part of it 
great perspective. So, Nikki, Jay, thank you both for uh, joining us. Uh, Jonathan, what a pleasure. I'm always glad for the opportunity to chat with you, but thanks so much for spending some time with us yeah. here. Thanks for having me. Go Bills. Go Bills, that's right. So, Jonathan Mayalis, director of the McCormick Civil War Institute at Shenandoah University. Please uh, check them out. They've got some great, great stuff going on over there. Jay Richardson, Nikki Rowan, thank you both for joining us. I'm Chris Mikowski for Emerging Civil War. We'll see you online and on the battlefield. Thank you, Chris. Yeah.